Take your Bible, if you would, please. Appreciate you all being here. Good to be in God's house. It's good to be around people that don't hate you. Amen? Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I started this last Sunday. And um, a series on the armor of God. Because we're living in days where we need it. I mentioned earlier uh, during Sunday school and um, a man called me and I'm not going to tell you who he was, where he's from, anything about him. I get calls like this and uh, even even if it's somebody in this church, uh, I'm bound Believe it or not, even though I'm not a Catholic priest, I'm still bound by confidentiality laws. I found that out years ago. If someone confesses sins to me, and that's happened many times, um, I have to be quiet about it. I can't even tell my wife. Um... People tell me things that are going on in their life. People tell me things that are going on in their family. And uh, when something bad happens to a good family, sometimes you just don't want that blabbered all over the place. But it makes illustrations of some of the things that I'm preaching, some of the things that I'm teaching, and some of the things that we need to be careful of. A man, he had been married... 14 years, and um, him and his wife and their children and other family members, they'd have, he'd lead them in Bible studies. And he was, seemed to be a good father, good husband, seemed to be a Christian, good, good worker, good employee. Said he was smart, very smart man. But he walked home one day, started packing his backpack, and his wife said, what are you doing? He said, I don't love you anymore, and I'm leaving. And left. And the family that called me, that was their daughter, and I said, I guarantee you, he didn't just wake up one day and decided he didn't, love his wife anymore didn't happen that way this had been worked on for a while the devil hit him with fiery darts and what is our defense against those darts the armor of God now the devil knows your number he knows how to dial you up, does he not? He knows how to get you started, does he not? He knows every one of us. He knows what darts to throw. He knows where to throw them. And the reason why the Bible's telling us about all of these things that we call the armor of God, he's telling us to put on the whole armor of God. Because I guarantee you, you leave some of it out, that's where, you, that's where the devil's aiming. And obviously, it is obvious to me, and I don't know this man, I wouldn't know him if he walked in here now. But it is obvious to me that that man took his armor off. It's obvious to me. He took his armor off, he walked out on his wife, walked out on his children, walked out on his job. Walked out of the place that he had to live. And I said, he had to, he didn't just walk, he ain't just sitting out in the street somewhere. The guy's got him something somewhere else. I don't know if it's another woman. Shoot, in this world could be another man. Am I right? But he laid his armor down. 
And in this world, we cannot afford to do that any longer. They're telling us things. And I try to present some of this stuff during Pastor Mike online. Some of this stuff that you might find hard to believe. There was a thing I was going to get to Thursday and I forgot all about it. I had the article. I might talk about it Tuesday. That in the Department of Defense somewhere. They are working on the ability to change time itself. You say that's not possible. I'll show you in the Bible that it is. I can show you where time stopped for a whole day. Because on that day, the sun nor the moon, they, they didn't move for a whole day. That tells me that time was altered somehow, some way. Hezekiah wanted a sign from Isaiah, the, the prophet, that he was going to live another 15 years. Isaiah said, well, you want the, see that, see that sundial over there? You want it to go forward? 10 degrees, you want it to go back 10 degrees. And Hezekiah thought, he said, well, it's already going, going to go forward 10 degrees. I want it to go back 10 degrees. And I want you to realize what that was. That wasn't God turning the sundial. That was God turning time. The Bible says that in the book of Daniel that the Antichrist will seek to change times and laws. And it will be given into his hand. What does that tell you? So now we're getting into Twilight Zone stuff. So there are things that some people don't believe in. I don't believe in UFOs. I don't believe people live on. Well, what if they showed up one day? I talked about a man this past week. Claimed to be a Christian. But he said that he had been abducted several times and he had a piece of metal stuck in his leg. He has no idea how it got there. When they pulled it out, they examined it. They said, there's no way this was made on this earth anywhere. There, we do not know how to make things like this. And the guy that did the documentary asked this man, I just felt sorry for him. And he said, if you find out this was made off world somewhere, what would that do to you? He said, well, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. He said, I consider myself a Christian. And he said, I know that God doesn't go around putting implants in everybody. So he said, I don't know what this will do to me. Would it cause him to drop his faith? If... All of a sudden, weird things started happening. Remember, there is a strong delusion coming to this world. I don't know exactly what it's going to be. But I know for a fact that if you don't have your armor on, you'll believe it. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. And the first thing out of the chute was dealing with the truth. The last Sunday, I made this about you being able to handle the truth about you. It starts there because if you can't handle the truth about you, there's nothing else that's going to affect you. Everything, nothing else matters. You have to be able to deal with the truth about yourself. And I could probably just have a testimony time in this church. Uh, at, stand up and tell us the day that God made you face yourself. Raise your hand. That was not easy to do, was it? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He's like wild E. Coyote. And why, remember, Wiley Coyote has the ability to pick a hole up and move it. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So when it comes to what spirits are able to do, let your imagination run. Because again, we're not talking about people. 
We're not talking about people who are in Congress. We're not talking about people who are president. We're not talking about people who are trying to run the earth. We're talking about spirits that can do a whole lot more than people can do. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Whole, the whole thing. It's, and with God, it is all or nothing. Can I say that again? With God, it is all or nothing. With God, God will not save part of you. And God will not accept part of you. It is all or nothing. God does not just speak the truth on one page of the Bible and have lies on the rest of it. It is all or it is nothing with God. That's his standard. So if you go out with part of the armor of God, it is as if you've gone out with nothing. And the devil knows it. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand. How many times do you use the word stand in here? Uh, verse 11, he says it. In verse 13, he says it. Withstand. In verse, in verse 13 again, having done all to stand. That's a third time. Fourth time he says it. Verse 14, stand. Therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, I've got an illustration for you. If you turn in your Bibles... Let me get to this here. This is actually at the end of my notes. Turn to Jeremiah 13. When you get there, say amen and we'll have prayer. Jeremiah 13. is actually, God illustrates all of his doctrines for us. Now, you know, to be honest, the phrase, having your loins girt about with truth, basically means underwear. Might as well say it. Underwear. So, make sure you have on clean underwear. Amen? Uh, listen. Guys that play sports, do not go out unprotected. I don't care if it's football, basketball, baseball, soccer. The only thing I think of maybe is chess. I don't think you need one where in, you know, playing chess. But in every other sport, you go out protected. Jeremiah 13, are you there? Say amen. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you, God, for making me... Rub, rubbing my nose in the truth. You rub my nose in it. And I did not like it. But I had to do it. You really left me without a choice. And that's fine. Oh, I guess I could have continued on the way I was going. I guess I could have. But when I saw what was happening, God, I, I, I couldn't bear it. I couldn't take it. And you made me deal with the truth. And I'm very thankful you did. Very thankful you did. And Father, I pray to your God that you bless all those that hear. Bless me. Help me to preach it right. Say it right. Do it in love. Help me to do this in love. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just open up your hands and feed your people today and help us to be prepared, dear God. The devil's got some tricks up his sleeve that if we knew about them now, we probably wouldn't believe it. But Lord, we are told that there's going to be great signs and lying wonders that are going to take place. These are huge things. These are things that it just blows men's minds at what they'll see and what it is that they're going to face. And Father, there's already people all over the world saying that if, if certain things happen, it'll destroy every religion in the world. Well, Father, that's exactly what I believe is going to happen. 
and your people, like this man who's faced, Father, with a situation that I don't know what church he goes to. I don't know what, he, what Bible he reads. I don't know anything about him. But I, I just know, God, that if he really loved you, he would seek you out and seek answers in your word. And you promised you would show them. And I pray for this man. I pray, God, that you do that for him. You've done it for all of us. You've shown us the truth. You caused us to believe it. You put it in our heart. We just accept it. We may not understand everything, but we believe it. And Father, help us, Father, with the truth. And to deal with the truth. And only, only the truth. Only the truth. Only the truth from this pulpit. Only the truth out of this church. Only the truth in the hearts of those who are here. Only the truth of those who join with us. Only the truth. Because if not, then we're good for nothing. To be trodden on the feet of men. Bless your word today. Bless these people, I pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Let me read you something out of Matthew. Brother Reg Kelly came here years ago. One of the first sermons he preached, and I'll never forget it. Never forget what he said. He said, if you were to go up and down the streets of Festus, Missouri, start knocking doors. Go over here to Crystal City, that apartment complex over there. People come to the door and say, Hi, I'm so-and-so from Bethel Church. I'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Just very simple questions. Uh, in your opinion, what are the churches in this town good for? You're probably going to find a lot of people who will say, well, I think they're good for nothing. Is that about right? How many scandals have happened in churches in this town? How many scandals have happened in big money, big money ministries? Jimmy Swaggart, Jimmy Baker, guys named Jimmy. These TBN preachers, that they know that all they want is everybody's money. And if you go around asking guys you work with, what do you think preachers are good for? I wouldn't give you a dime for a box full of them. They, all they want is your money. They want your money and they want to prey on your wife or your daughter. So I ain't got no, I ain't got not no time for that nonsense. I ain't going to church nowhere. I believe in God. That's my business and, and I'll just deal with it that way. That's what is in most people's minds. And in Matthew chapter 5, and this is the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus told him in verse 13, You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? If we are the salt of this earth, salt is a preservative. Salt is what they used to rub on meat. And they put it in, put meat in salt brine and that would cure it. And that would keep it without refrigeration. They learned that. That's what salt's good for. It's a preservative. It's whatever. But he said... If the salt loses its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth, and he says the words, good for nothing. Good for nothing. But to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. And we are, right now in this country, being trodden under the feet of men. We have against us an entire government that is in the process of creating and enforcing laws that will make it difficult for us to maintain the status quo of us being able to come to church, preach the gospel. We've already found out they can kick you off YouTube. They can kick you off Twitter. They can kick you off Facebook. They can kick you off all these platforms that we are currently using right now to reach the people that we are reaching. And, it, and I attribute the blessing and, the, and I use the word success, but it's God's work. But I attribute the success of the ministry that God has given us with the fact that so far we've been allowed on Facebook. We've been allowed on Twitter. We've been allowed on YouTube. We were out where everybody else is. It's called the marketplace of ideas. And people have found us and they like us and they're listening to us now as a result of it. YouTube has, a, has an algorithm that knows what you're looking for when you go online. 
That's why some of you have found our videos in your YouTube little sideline deal there. It's because they know you like things on the King James Bible. You like to hear about giants. You like to hear about UFOs. You like to hear about Bigfoot. You like to hear about doctrine. And Google knows that. And it delivered you our videos. You start watching them. Say, man, I like this guy. I'm going to watch him for a while. Make sure he's not going to lie. And then you start it and you consider yourself part of our church. Well, what if they kicked us all off? And I've been asked that question, Pastor, what are we going to do if they kick us all off? I had my first video taken down from YouTube a couple weeks ago. And I didn't do nothing wrong. They just took it down. That's because the people who run Google, the people who run Twitter, the people who run Facebook, if you were to ask their opinion of what the churches in this country are good for, they'll say they're good for nothing. Or else they wouldn't censor them. Am I right? So now, Jeremiah 13, are you there? Say amen. Look at verse, now remember, he said, the loin, having your loins girt about with truth. So look at Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord unto me, go and get thee a linen girdle. Yes, it's manly for guys to wear guidles. Girls wear girdles, guys wear guidles. Do what? Yeah. It's manly. Basically a loincloth. It was a, just a wrap back then. Aren't you glad that we've progressed in loincloth technology, guys? But he said, get thee a linen girdle and put it upon thy loins and put it not in water. So I got a girdle according to the word of the Lord and put it on my loins. The word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, Take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, arise and go to Euphrates, as the Lord commanded, uh, uh, and hide it there in the hole of the rock. So it goes down the river bank, finds a rock right at the edge of the water, and he shoves that girdle, that loincloth, his underwear, next, under that rock in the water. Verse 5, so I went and hid it by Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. And it came to pass after many days, he didn't say how long it'd take, that the Lord said unto me, Arise, go to Euphrates and take the girdle from thence, which I commanded thee to hide there. Then I went to Euphrates and digged and took the girdle from the place where I had hid it. And behold, the girdle was marked. Imagine that. End up full of holes. Now what do you do? With holy underwear. Throw it away. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't even put it in a rag box. You might end up waxing the car with it. You don't want to be seen doing that, do you? So he said, then I went Euphrates and digged and took the girdle from the place where I'd hid it. And behold, the girdle was marred and it was profitable for what? Nothing. And let me say this, this is your average Christian and your average church in this country. They are good for nothing. When that hurricane came toward Houston, and they had begged Joel Osteen, open up that big basketball center that you bought and turned it into a church, and let people spend the night in there, because they're going to lose their house. What did he say? Well, we can't let them in our church. And the people of that town said that man's good for nothing. It is obvious to us he's a fake and a phony. He puts on a big smile, talks about sending him all your money, and he's going to help everybody with it. And yet, when the time came to help, actually help his neighbors... Turned him down. Turned him away. That guy's an idiot anyway. Amen? It's okay for you to amen, idiot. Joel Osteen. Girdle was marred and it was profitable for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Thus saith the Lord, after this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people which refuse to hear my words. Now he's making the connection here. Refuse to hear my words. 
which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall be even be as this girdle, which is, say it, good for nothing. And I don't want our church to be that way. Now, I went through the deal last week. God judges by truth. Now, the focus of last week was dealing with the truth about yourself. God's word was written to you, for you, with you in mind. It's got every thought that you ever thought in it. And it's got every sin that you've ever committed inside this book. And God warns you, number one, against committing that sin. You went and committed it anyway. God then tells you, this is what I'm going to do to you when you commit this sin. And God did exactly that. But then God tells you, I can offer you mercy and salvation because you did those sins. And we have found that God was right on that. We have found that, yes, we can, in fact, trust God. Somebody say amen. But the truth does not change with time. Uh, a man came by one day. You pray for him. I'll admit his first name is Chris. Some of you know him. Is when he first started coming to this church. And he pulled down in the parking lot, came to the door. I didn't know who he was, so he waited out in his car. And when he saw me going out to mine, he, he jumped out and he introduced himself. And he said, I live just down the road here, peace. And he said, I was going over to this Assembly of God church somewhere. He didn't tell me which one. I didn't ask. And he said, I've been listening to you online. He said, you, uh, you said some things. And I, he said, I agree with it. It's in the Bible. And he said, it bothered him that in his church, they will have women preachers. He said, it bothers me that they've got women up there preaching. And he said, it bothers me. They got women that are squawking and preaching and speaking in tongues and all this stuff. And he said, so I went to ask my preacher with the Bible in my hand. I read him the verse. Uh, out of the uh, first Corinthians 14, let your women remain silent in the churches. It read several other verses. And he said, now explain to me how come we can have women preachers in our church. And they're all in there in the church, not being silent, speaking in tongues everywhere. And this preacher said, well, that's not really written for us. That was written for those people back in that time back there. And they had their reasons for it. But it, and, and basically, I don't know if that preacher really grasped what he was doing or not. But what he was saying was. God was either lying then or he's lying now. Because what he said was that the Bible, that part was written to some people that lived 2,000 years ago. It's still in the Bible, but it's not written for us now. I can show you the verses where it says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and I change not. The same God that our forefathers and our ancestors served, they served the same God that we serve. He, our God's not double-minded. Our God does not change His mind. He does not alter the thing that goes out of His mouth. If God says it, it, it was true 6,000 years ago, it's true 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and it's still true today. I did talk about, on Thursday, I talked about how in the classroom. Guess what, Jennifer? Bill Gates thinks you're not capable of adding or dividing 212 by 4. That was the thing I come up with. Bill Gates thinks that you're not capable of dividing 212 by 4. Because he's donating money now to schools all over the country that are altering the math curriculum. Now, think about this. They rewrite history. That's okay. And I know we don't speak King James English. I get that. But to say that if you've got two apples on this side and two apples on this side, they're the same, aren't they? See, an, an equation, an equal sign means that what you got over here is the same as what you got over here. Right? And it doesn't change whether you go to Africa. I've been to Africa. You know, they do, they do the same math over there we do over here. Can you imagine that? Chinese people, same math. Europeans, same math. Russians, same math. South America, same math. They're saying in the curriculum now 
that the way you divide 212 by 4 is white supremacist thinking. That's white man's math. Whitey can do math like that. But if you're people of color, obviously you can't do math like that. I would be furious at that guy for saying that my people are too stupid to know how to do two plus two. Math doesn't change, numbers don't change, and God's word doesn't change. Psalm 105, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Listen, if it was wrong for a man to leave his wife and go sleep with another woman 4,000 years ago, is it still wrong now? If a man lies, if a child lies to his parents 4,000 years ago, is it still wrong to lie to your parents today? Is it still wrong to kill somebody? Is it to take innocent life? Is it still wrong to covet? Is it still wrong to dishonor your parents? Is it still wrong to have other gods? Is it still wrong to take the Lord's name in vain? There are things, hey, young people, listen, listen to me, young people. I'm about sick of hearing the Lord's name taken in vain. God said, don't do it. And you better not be doing it. Because God will not handle that very well. His truth endureth to all generations. The Ten Commandments were given some 3,000 years before the time of Christ. They're still valid. Actually, it's 2,000 some odd years before the time of Christ. They're still valid now. And they will continue to be valid. This is why the ACLU and everybody else wanted them taken out of the classrooms. Because they said, that's religion and we can't have that. Besides that, we don't want these kids learning that they shouldn't commit adultery. But God's truth doesn't change with time. His morality does not, is not altered just because people don't want to live that way any longer. If God said it was wrong then, it's still wrong now. Psalm 117, 2, For His merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. So, if our forefathers put on the Word of God as their truth, and their loins were girt about the Word of God, because it was true, if it worked for them, and these the same devils that were around then are around now. It's the same devils. The devil has not died he is still the same devil. He attacks in the same way. And he's coming after every one of us. If we're not careful and we're not armored, then we will believe the lies. If you ever look at this Bible and in one thing say, I don't believe that's true. Remember, it's all or nothing with God. You can't say... Now, this part of the Bible, I think, is probably wrong. That story about Noah and that boat and saving all the animals, I don't believe that. But I do believe that he loves me. I'm sorry, that don't cut it with God. Psalm 146, 6. God, which made heaven and earth, the sea and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever. That means that he preserved every single word that he had Moses, Job, the scholars, or the, excuse me, who am I thinking of? The, the, um, the scribes, Isaiah, Matthew, John, Paul, everything that they wrote down has been preserved perfectly. They have been translated correctly and there is not anything in this book that is wrong, was ever wrong, or will ever be wrong. Be thankful that you got a pastor that will, say, that will go to God and say, God, are there UFOs anywhere? Be thankful that you have a pastor like that. Because what if they show up? What if they show up? What if gods start descending down from the sky and come to take over this earth? 
They say that it's going to destroy. If we find out there's life other than on earth, well, it'll destroy all the religions. Not ours if you believe this book. Not ours if you believe this book. Now, I'm not saying you've got to be some UFO expert. I'm not saying you've got to go study that. That may not interest you. That's fine with me. But I can take you through this book and show you the marvelous things that God has in here. That I believe the devil is going to try to throw on this earth to get them to believe a lie. And with some people, it will cause them to walk away from this book. Um, where was I going to go? Let me read some verses here. When God judges... He will always judge according to his truth and not anybody else's. Romans 2, 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. What was he talking about? If you go back to, in fact, turn to Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Because the such things that he's mentioning here are in chapter 1. In verse 29. Well, in fact, let's go back a little bit. Verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. So what has happened over the years is that the scholars from the Bible colleges got a hold of the Bible... And they have altered it significantly enough to where things that used to be a sin are no longer a sin anymore. Things like fornication, things like sodomy, things that used to be wrong. God bless Kenya. God bless you people. In Kenya, it's still wrong to be a sodomite. In Kenya, it's against the law. Amen. Amen. You know where they got that from? The Word of God. So, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So he's talking about sodomites here. Male and female both. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meat. I can show you churches in this county that have turned over into an acceptance of sodomy and saying then that it is a, it is a sin to preach against it. I can show you churches in this county that are like that. Baptist churches that have turned that way. Churches you would have never thought would turn that way are turning that way. They have failed to take the very first armor of God with their loins girt about with truth. They have failed to receive the truth to protect themselves. And that is exactly where the devil is aimed at them. And he will destroy them. And they are good for nothing. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. But being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inv inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable. Uh, that means you cannot talk to them. Unmerciful. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now that is the list that he gives. And he says in Romans chapter 2 verse 2, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. That means if you commit them, you better be ready to face the judgment of Almighty God. 
Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in what? That means tell God what you did wrong. Don't hold anything back from him and don't feign to approach God without being willing to confess every sin. Because if you hold them back, God won't forgive them. Isaiah 28, 15. Because ye have said we've made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through it shall not come, un, not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. I preached on that last Sunday. Isaiah 59, 4. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. I think that everybody who participated in cheating in this last election should be held for treason against their country. Now that probably won't happen. So where do we stand? We stand as a nation that has grossly done injustice, unjust things. But will God let them get away with it? He won't. God will turn those people over to a reprobate mind and then he'll hold them there until the day when he's ready to judge them and then he will judge them. Mark it down. None calleth for justice nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Notice the, notice the language here. Conceiving and bringing forth are birthing terms. Or let's call it fruit terms. If you lie and hide behind those lies, you will then reap the fruit of those lies. Will you not? Isaiah 59 verse 14, Judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. Isaiah 59 15, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Jeremiah 7, 28, But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. I do believe that there are still some people in this country who believe the truth and know the truth and honor the truth. Do you believe that? Say amen. But the numbers are waning. Jeremiah 9, verse 3, and I'm almost done. They bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders. For they will deceive every one his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies, and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them, and for how shall I do for the daughter of my people? Their tongue is as an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in heart he layeth his weight. That's called bearing false witness against thy neighbor. Now, I don't see in here, anywhere, the notes that I put in here last night. But I know what it was. As some of you know, I've been, I've been greatly bothered recently. It's been, bothered, been boiling for a long time. So much to the point now that I've, I've shut off a good portion of the websites that I used to go to to find out the news, what's going on. I've cut most of them off because they're full of lies. The way I see it right now, 
The devil has successfully so muddied the waters of truth on the internet that it is nearly impossible to find things that are actually true if you're going to look on the internet. We know the left wing, we know they're lying. All their websites, the Drudge Report, they were bought out. They're no, Matt Drudge is no longer in charge of it. Somebody else is editing the content on Drudge Report and they're throwing out stuff down. I haven't read them for years. I won't say for years, but at least for a year. Another website that I go to, it's got all right wing stuff. But as I look across the, the news stories that are on there, I can see that they are severely slanted toward the right wing. So much so that they're saying things that I just seriously doubt that they're even true. So if somebody's lying to you, either from a liberal side or conservative side, does it matter? They're still lying, right? And causing people to believe things that are just not true. And then you have the people who are inventing sins. Now let me ask you what a sin is. This was in my notes. I don't have my notes. So what is a sin according to the Bible? Is it what your neighbor says is wrong? Is it what the government says is wrong? What is a sin according to the Bible? Huh? There's two verses. Whatsoever is without faith is sin. And then James said, sin is a transgression of the law. And did God not write down everything that he said was wrong, is wrong? Did not God write them all down in the book? So you've got people all over the internet now, scared to death, scared to death that if they do something, somebody's going to bark at them and they'll be guilty of a sin and God won't forgive them. They'll tell them they'll lose their salvation over it. I mean, I grew up fundamental, conservative, most of my life. I was taught that if you had hair that touched your ears, well, that's, that's not God's way. Is it wrong for a man to have his hair touch his ears? God didn't say anything about it, did he? I was told that chewing tobacco was a sin. Have you ever read in the scriptures anywhere, God said don't chew tobacco? Have you ever read that anywhere? One old boy said, Preacher, I agree with you. <laughs> and he said, When it comes out smoking, I'm again that. If anybody burns something tastes this good, it's got to be a sin. God didn't say anything anywhere about chewing tobacco. God didn't say anything anywhere about a lot of the things that people call a sin. God said, did God ever say it's wrong to have a TV set? No, but he did say, I will put no unclean thing before my eyes. It ain't wrong to have television. It's wrong to watch what you watch on television. See, God did have it covered, did he not? There's people that say, if you go to a doctor, you don't trust God, therefore you're not a Christian. But did God ever say that? There are people who are asking me, how come I don't preach against big pharma, pharmaceutical companies? Well, if you show me in the Bible where it is a sin to take medicine, I will gladly preach on it. Did God say anywhere in this Bible that it is a sin to take medicine? But people make that a sin so they can make you guilty of it and they're lying through their teeth. And the internet's full of them. If you go to a doctor, you're sinning. If you take medicine, you're sinning. If, uh, if we don't go to church on Saturday, we're sinning. Did God say that anywhere? No. 
Uh, if um, I forgot, man, I had a whole bunch of you. May, maybe I'd be glad I didn't have those notes with me. Because I had all kinds of stuff written down that maybe, maybe you have accused others of doing. And God never said they were wrong. So I'm saying to you today, be careful what you judge others with when you start judging people on the internet. I had people get mad at me and said, I'm not saved because I took the grandkids to Disney World once. I'm not kidding you. You did what? You went to Disney World? He's a false prophet. I'll tell you that right now. Now, I hated it because there was a million people there. I don't plan on ever going back. It is not a sin to go to Disney World. And one thing I hate is for people to invent false sins. You know what that tells me? It tells me that they left behind the loins girded with truth. They're not covered. You see, because the people who bark the loudest against what they say you do, ask them the question, what do they do? What are they doing on the internet? What are they doing that they don't want anybody to find out about? And that gets back to the truth about yourself. I better quit because I've run out of my notes. I'll have to find them. Let's go by the truth, shall we? Before we start judging people, before we start looking down our nose at people, let's go by the truth the way God does. Let's bow our heads. Father, I love you. And I admit before you and these people that throughout my years I've judged people unjustly. I've judged men for having long hair. I've judged people for not living the way I pretended to live. Said that it wasn't possible that they could be saved. And I've done great injustice to the grace of God. You didn't save me, Father, because I dress like a man and I like my hair short. You didn't save me because of that. You saved me because I was a rotten sinner. That was doing far worse things. And you saved me. You saved me, Father, because you loved me. And I was wicked. Desperately wicked above all things. And my heart was deceitful. Just like you saved these people. Father, help us to not judge anyone before the time. Help us, dear God, that our mind is right and our heart is right. Help us to understand, Father, that lost people are going to act the way lost people act because they're lost. They act the way we acted when we were lost. Help us to remember that. Help us, Father, to be a church and a church body that is good for something in this world because of the truth. Help us to live the truth, believe the truth, trust the truth, trust you, for preaching the truth and trust your word and your word alone is the only thing that's true in this world. Help that, Father, to be our guide and not our own version of things. Bless your people. Thank you, God, for speaking to us this morning. We love you and we ask for your blessings in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. If you stand to your feet... Then you're dismissed. <laughs>